Yes, let's say thank you to the Blackstock family. I appreciate Jonah and Nick and Brittany. And I, I don't know about you, I was just hanging on the edge of my seat seeing what Jonah was going to do next uh, throughout that whole video. Um, but uh, thank you. We're so thankful for our children's moments. And our praise team, thank you for leading us to the throne room of God this morning. Uh, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to be opening to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, every week for the past several weeks, uh, I've gotten up and I've tried to communicate uh, the message of Hebrews to us. And this has been a, uh, it's been a, a long endeavor. We've been in this series for a few months now, but the message of the Hebrews preacher or author is, hey, don't give up, don't drift, don't fade, but keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And so as important as doctrine is, we don't glue our eyes to doctrine. As important as the church is, we don't glue our eyes to the church. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We focus on Jesus. He's the pioneer. He's the perfecter of our faith. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was on the playground with uh, some of our children and then some children that weren't uh, my biological children, uh, but we were all playing and, and having a good time. And there was uh, a five-year-old on the playground with us, uh, not my child, but uh, he just looked at me and he, he kind of had that light bulb moment. He said, hey, you're the one that gets up and speaks to the church. And I said, well, I said, yes, I, I get up, you know, uh, most Sundays and, and I'll preach to the church. And then he looked at me with this, this real kind of inquisitive look on his face. He said, so are you the boss of the church? <laughs> and I said, and I knew I had a, I had a teachable moment here. Like uh, this was something that I, I'd been preparing for, for, for years. And I just looked at him just straight in the eye. And, and I said, I said, no, I'm not the boss of the church. Jesus is the boss of the church. And I've learned that it works out a lot better that way. And he was like, Oh, okay, cool. See ya. You know, and they walked off after that. Uh, but but I, I just realized in that moment that, you know, as your preaching minister, I, I don't get all, everything right. But on that day, that was good preaching. That Jesus is the head of the church. We try to put other people up as the head, and, and we try to say that, oh, this person or that person, is, and, and, and what we fail to realize is that Jesus has clearly stated who the head of the church is. It's him. He's the boss. He's the Lord. And this is some of what the Hebrews writer is trying to communicate. How are you making daily decisions to focus on Jesus? The Hebrews preacher has been saying, hey, you, you've made a confession. You've confessed with your, your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Are you living out that confession? Or were those just empty words that you said? So what does it look like to live out that confession, to not drift? So when I do premarital counseling with couples, oftentimes we'll, we'll talk about, hey, a wedding is a beautiful thing, but how is it launching you to live out your marriage? How is it launching you to live the married life? Baptism is a beautiful, beautiful confession. As we enter the water, we die with Christ and we rise with him. A beautiful picture of death, burial, and resurrection. But how are you living the baptized life? Baptism isn't where it ends, it's where it begins. And so when life is shaking you, when life is pressing in on every side, how are you focusing? What is your attention focusing on? In Hebrews 12, chapter 4, we'll pick up in the text. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord's discipline, the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. This is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3. The Hebrew preacher or writer or author uh, quotes from the Old Testament more than almost any other book in the New Testament. I think Romans and Matthew are the only ones that have more Old Testament quotes in it than Hebrews. Verse 7, 
Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, then everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet. That's from Proverbs chapter four. So that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. May God bless the reading of his word. If I were to ask you, why is the Christian life so hard? How would you respond? For some, a response may be a rejection to the question. For some, your response may be, well, you know, the Christian life's not hard. Jesus said, my burden is, is light, my yoke is easy. So you may even reject the question. For many of us, though, I, I think that we would acknowledge that, you know, life is hard. <laughs> life in Christ is hard. There, there are things about it that, that produce weight and that, that, that produce things in us that, that are sometimes shaken. A few years ago, there was an article that came out uh, titled, Googling God. And what the article revealed was that often people are more honest with Google than they are with their own family or their friends or the people at church. People are more honest with Google than they are even a therapist. Because the questions that people will type into Google are questions that they would never ask to people standing around them. So some of the top questions that the author did research on to find out where the, the faith questions were and what they were that were Googled, a few of the top questions were, why does God allow suffering? Why does God hate me? Why did God make me ugly? Why does God want us to worship him? Why doesn't God answer my prayers? And so according to this particular research, it wasn't that these folks who were typing in these questions to Google, it wasn't that they didn't believe in God, it, it was that they were disappointed in the God that they believed in. Googling God. In the book of Hebrews, you have people asking all kinds of questions. They're getting pressed. This whole Christian thing doesn't seem to be working out so well for me. And so people are starting to step away from their confession. And then you have phrases in what we just read, and, and I realize that what we just read could be difficult in some situations because not, of us, not all of us had a good father. And so, so we read that and we think, you know, well, well what's, the, what's the writer trying to say? But as we read the text, some of these phrases come out in, in sharing God's holiness and the peaceful fruit of righteousness. These are, are weighty theological expressions. They don't deserve some trite, cl cliche kind of response to them. But the Hebrews preacher is helping the listener to understand them in a more familial kind of way. Did you listen to kind of the heartbeat of the text we just read? Why do good parents discipline their children? The answer is that good parents exercise discipline because they want their children to grow up to share their values and their commitments. We serve a God who enters into our own suffering. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because, because you are with me. Bob Goff, who is a author and also uh, worked at Pepperdine University for several years, tells a story of him going to a, a concert and he, he knew a couple of the band members and so he was invited backstage to talk with the band. He doesn't say what band it is, we just know that it's a, it's a popular band, so insert your favorite band, whoever that is. And he walks backstage and he's, he's talking with the band members and they're, they're laughing, they're having a good time. And he notices that there's another gentleman in the room kind of sitting at the end of the table. And about, about halfway through the conversation, he just makes eye contact with a gentleman and he, he's 
uh, just kind of blown away. This guy's just sitting there and not, like, not trying to insert himself in the conversation or not trying to, because a lot of times in those situations, that's what people do. And he's just sitting there and he's, he's just convicted by this guy sitting in the room with him. So they, they continue the conversation with the, with the band and, and then finally it comes to the time, well, hey, it's time for us to go out and do the show. Uh, so somebody comes and, and takes Bob Goff and this other gentleman who's been in the room and, and begins to escort them to their seats. Well, as soon as they, they walk into the auditorium, uh, people start kind of nudging each other and pointing, not at Bob Goff. They start kind of nudging and pointing at this guy who's walking in with Bob Goff. And so finally, Bob Goff can't take it anymore. So he, he sits down in his seat and, and he asks his neighbor, he says, hey, who is this guy? Why is everybody going so crazy about this guy being here? And his neighbor says, well, that's Jim Caviezel. He played Jesus in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And Bob had no idea who he was. And Bob was later reflecting. He said, you know what? I was in the room with Jesus for an hour and didn't even know it. <laughs> and I love that story because of, of, of the way it paints the picture of Jesus being here with us. He's with me. I was sitting with someone who was giving me some spiritual mentorship just a few weeks ago. And I was talking and I was telling, you know, all of the, the struggles that, you know, I go through in this role sometimes and, and just trying to just kind of unpack and, 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 and talk through some of those things. And it was just right in, in this, this pivotal moment in our conversation, the person I was talking with just stopped and said, I, I want you to look in that chair right over there the empty chair. Jesus has been there the whole time. What would you ask him? What would you say to him? I was like, you done, you done brought Jesus in the room. I'm trying, I'm trying to talk about all my situation and what's going on, and now, now he's here. And what I realized is the same thing that Bob Guy realized, is that, that Jesus was there all along. He's with us. How many times have we failed to realize that Jesus is in the room with us? We live much of our lives unaware, drifting in our own way toward God, not realizing that he's already right there beside us. Distraction steals our awareness, and living distracted steals our joy. And so we sing, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And then we go home and we fill ourselves with so many distractions. So many things that turn our attention away. The Hebrew preacher says, make every effort to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. And then, then comes this crescendo moment in the sermon probably would have taken the, the Hebrews preacher about 40 minutes to get here. It's taken us three months. Somebody say, get on with it, preacher, right? <laughs> about three months, and we now are at chapter 12. But when this was originally communicated, it was likely communicated in the form of a, of a sermon, maybe a letter, but, but it was, it was somebody, something that was read in context. It was read all together. It was preached all together. And about 40 minutes, here, here it comes in, in chapter 12. We get to verse 18. You've not come to a mountain. The preacher's referring to Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were given. You've not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it beg that no further word be spoken to them, verse 20, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death from Exodus 19. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear, Deuteronomy 9. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to be sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And the church said, amen. The preacher says, 
here's how glorious it's going to be. And I want you to live in a way that honors that. Before we had kids, I was working in the insurance industry. Lainey was in pharmacy school. And we uh, wanted to take a vacation to Florida, <clears throat> but we knew timing-wise it wasn't a good time. We didn't really have the money to do it. And so I'm, I'm sitting at work one day, and, and I take a, a little break, and I get a call on my phone from Hilton Hotels. And so they begin painting this picture of this hotel in Florida. And, and all of the amenities that go along with it. And I, I, usually, I usually run from these things, but, but I'm hooked. I'm, I'm all in. And so by the, by the end of the, the, the phone conversation, part of it is, is the problem I have, I have a problem telling people no. But, but another part of the problem was that they just painted this beautiful picture of what it was going to be like over the phone. And so at the end of the phone call, I booked, I booked the vacation. And I go home, and uh, I said, hey, babe, you're not going to believe it. You know that vacation that we said we couldn't do? We're doing it. <laughs> We're going. And after a few moments of intense fellowship, <laughs> I promptly unbooked the vacation. <laughs> Canceled it. Unfortunately, I, you had 24 hours to cancel it, and I was within the 24-hour window. What the author and preacher wants to do is to paint this picture, this beautiful picture of what's to come. And it's almost as if he puts Mount Sinai up against Mount Zion. You'll see that picture on the screen. Mount Sinai, where the tablets are given, the people come out of Egypt, Moses goes up there to meet with God. Mount Zion, this is the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, where Jesus has made all things right and will make all things right. Both holy mountains. Mount Sinai, where the old covenant was given. Mount Zion, where the new covenant was given through Christ. Mount Sinai, only Moses could come up to meet with God. Mount Zion, all believers are anointed to be ministers and missionaries and disciple makers. The four ladies that are going to Honduras are not labeled as, as some positional title of missionaries. No, we're, we're all missionaries. We're all disciple makers. We're all drawn into the presence of God. Mount Sinai, sacrifice needs to be made every year. Mount Zion, Jesus died once for all, a sacrifice once for all on the cross. Mount Sinai had a lot of fire on it to kill and destroy and to threaten. Mount Zion has some fire too, doesn't it? But this fire was to purify, to sift, and to make you who God wants you to be. So don't keep going back to this mountain, but press ahead to this one where access has been given to all of you. You don't need a preacher. You don't need a priest. You don't need an elder. You have been given access through the blood of Jesus. So keep pressing on toward this mountain, Mount Zion. Verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. This is the final warning of the sermon. You'll remember a few weeks ago, I told you there were five warnings in this sermon. This is the final one. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. A call to passionately pursue gratitude for all that God has done. We are a people that are constantly being shaken. Many of you have been shaken by life. 
We've been shaken by what happened in Buffalo and Uvalde and Ukraine. So thankful our, our missions team is planning on announcing some relief efforts that we can be a part of uh, later this week. We've been shaken by fear and doubt, uncertainty, maybe of a loved one. We've been shaken by anxiety or depression. We've been shaken, and the Hebrew author, preacher, reminds the church of old and the church today that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we do not waver from our vision. We do not waver as we seek first the kingdom. Kingdom devoted disciples, making disciples of nations and generations. If you have your communion elements this morning, I want to encourage you to be pulling those out. If you did not receive a packet, uh, will you please just raise your hand where you're at? We'll be happy to bring a packet to you. I see one back here. Couple over here. Thank you. This meal or the semblance of this meal helps propel us into living out our confession. In the courts of Zion, there's but one verdict, not guilty. And those who have come to this city have passed through the gateway of the great high priest, Jesus who has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. We read that back in Hebrews chapter 10. None of us could stand under the law or the judgment of Sinai. But here in Zion, the son who was for a little while made lower than the angels has already paid the debt on our behalf. And so the congregation that is hearing this message in Hebrews must decide, just as we must decide whether to shrink back or to have faith, whether to peace out or to hold fast to our confession. The bread and the cup remind us that we can approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Our God is a consuming fire. And those apart from God's mercy are terrible words. Yet in Christ, and because of his finished work, these are words of hope and a promise of saving purification. I want you to hold the bread and the cup in your hand. We're going to pray for the bread, and then we're going to receive it. And so, Father, we bow in this moment, thankful for this, this meal. It's only a little piece of bread and a little cup of juice. But our minds go back to that first Lord's Supper where you gathered with your disciples. They had many questions. They were being shaken. One would even betray you. We take ourselves back. And we take a moment to imagine us sitting at that table.
What are the thoughts that are going through our minds? What are the questions that we have? What are the uncertainties that we face? We hold the bread and the cup and we receive a glance from the Lamb of God. The one who would soon be beaten. The one who would soon be ridiculed and mocked. The one who would soon be humiliated. We receive the glance. What, is he, what does he say? Does he say anything? What's going through your mind? And then he offers you this little piece of bread, which we've turned into even a smaller cracker. And he says, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Remember me. Don't drift. Remember. Father, as we receive the bread this morning, we're grateful. We receive it with grateful hearts. We take it with the body of believers, not only in this room, but worldwide, the global community. We take it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Let's pray for the cup. And so, Father, we're mindful and grateful as we continue this communion meal. We're grateful that we have the privilege of sitting on the other side of this first meal. I've thought sometimes of going up to Moses when we meet in the heavenlies and just say, man, I'm so, I wish I could have seen what you saw. And, and, and I see Moses looking right back at me and saying, are you kidding me? I wish that I could have lived when you lived with the indwelling Holy Spirit with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ being in my life. So, Father, as we drink the cup this morning, we're, we're reminded of the blood that, that draws us to the mountain, the Mount Zion, the blood that gives us all access and all access pass to you. And for that, we're eternally grateful so that we live in the here and now, knowing that your kingdom has come 
and that it is coming. And we pray that your will be done in our lives. In Jesus we pray, amen. The blood of Christ given for you. If you came prepared to give today, uh, you may do so in the four year on your way out. You may also give online. We thank you for your faithfulness and your continued generosity. As we close this morning, I just want to ask the question of how will we live out our confession this week? How will we live out our confession in our homes? How will we live out our confession in our places of work? How will we live out our confession at school? How will we live out our confession in the people that we come in contact with this week? Will they know that Christ is inside of us by the way that we love, by the way that we show mercy, and by the way that we interact with others? This morning, if you have a, a prayer need, uh, if there's something that is going on in your life that our shepherds can pray with you about, that's what they're here to do. That's what they love to do. There'll be a shepherd down front. There'll also be a shepherd and a spouse back here in this room, the chapel. If you'd like a more private setting, uh, you can go there in just a moment. Let's pray, and then I'll ask you to stand and sing. Father, we again just thank you for the gifts of this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a word that, that pierces. It is a word that convicts. It is a word that challenges, and it is a word that became flesh through your son, Jesus. May we live each day for his glory and his honor, and may we submit daily to his authority and lordship in our lives, for he truly is the boss. And we're thankful that you've given us such a perfect and good Lord. It's in Jesus we pray, amen.